few years ago, I went to a talk in London and it was entitled Escaping the Prison of Your Mind. And this very accomplished looking woman stood up at the podium and she started talking. And I got the shock of my life because as she started talking, she was talking about the fact that she'd been a prisoner five times. And she said that one of the times when she was in prison, somebody came into the, to the prison, I, I guess it was a volunteer, and gave a really empowering talk about free choice and about not being a victim and about how to live a life in a free way. And she said that evening, she sat on the edge of her bed, her prison bed, and she suddenly had this amazing realization that she, not, she wasn't imprisoned by the walls, by the physical walls of prison. She was actually imprisoned by her mind, by the way that she was thinking about herself that was what was hemming her in and causing her to have such a limited life. And it was incredible, very inspiring to see because with this realization, she started freeing herself up and opening her mind to her own worth and opportunities that she had. And she was successful enough to, get, to go on, get her degree and to be talking at this conference that I was at. And I was thinking about it that we obviously were at the time of year of Pesach and the Jewish year is, is really incredible in the way that each part of the year has its own energy to it. We don't just commemorate historical events. Obviously we do commemorate and we're grateful for what happened way back when, but it's not just a commemoration, it's that we are reliving that energy that was present then historically. We are reliving it in our own lives. I was giving my, um, my son a lift tonight. He's back from yeshiva. It's very exciting. And, and I was talking to him about this. And, I, and we're trying to come up with what's a good analogy for that. And we, the best we could come up with is birthdays. Birthdays aren't just a commemoration. You know, my, my Mimi, my five-year-old, her fifth birthday is coming up. And she's all excited about it. She's not all excited about the fact that she was born five years ago. She's excited because she's going to get their attention and their appreciation of who she is right now as a five-year-old. So in exactly the same way, when it comes to a time like Pesach, we are, yes, we are commemorating the freedom of our people and the way that we were brought out from being slaves into freedom, but we are also tuning in and appreciating the, the energy in the air of freedom right here, right now that we can actually tune into and incorporate into our lives to be able to live more free. So obviously we're aware that Pesach cleaning involves spray and cloth and physical practical cleaning, but really tonight what we're going to focus on is Pesach cleaning our mind and seeing what might be cluttering up our mind in a way that's causing us to, to live in a constricted way in a way where we're seeing ourselves in a tight way, in a limited way, we're seeing our loved ones possibly in that way too, and possibly our life circumstances also. So when we're able to open our minds, that's when we're going to be able to experience things so, so differently, in and in obviously in a far more free way. So I have my little props. Those of you who know me know I like my props. So this is, this is what I'm sure all of us can relate to what our minds can look like when they get going. I've got so much to do and how I'm going to manage that. And oh no, why did I say that to them? They're probably so upset with me. And what's the matter? Why am I I'm always getting things wrong? And everyone else seems to have it together. And, right? This is how our minds can look. And the good news is that Hashem has made and built in us a system, a very natural system, the same way that we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide, when, when our minds get very cluttered and busy, we have an inbuilt system in us that will, they will clear. We can, we can absolutely believe and hope that even the most cluttered moment of the most cluttered mind will clear. And when it clears, we will see ourselves, that person, the circumstance that we're stressing about, um, the number of guests that are coming or whatever it is that, that we're 
stressing about, we will see that in a calmer, clearer way. So if you, if you look, I know it's not that clear on the screen, but if you look at it, it's not like I have to put all those white pieces down. The very momentum of getting still and, and just being allows them to start settling automatically. So we're going to learn tonight together in the time that we have, we're going to learn three ways that allow us to be able to let, even in the most cluttered moments, it's not that we have to try and force ourselves to be calm and be okay and be confident. It's okay if we're cluttered, but what we do want to learn is how can we allow this natural mechanism to kick in of our mind settling down? What are the signposts to that that are going to help us to do that? Um, okay, so we said ABC, and as Sifty mentioned before, it was a very quick uh, title that I made, but um, it really does incorporate everything that, I want to, that we want to learn together tonight. So A is for accept. Now I'm just going to screen share a second. Um, Thank you to my SD who made this PowerPoint for us. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we can see here, oh, we've got the kids, it's all very fancy. So we can see here the ABC, okay? These are the ways that we relate to ourselves. Like we said before, it's our mind. It's our mind that's getting cluttered. That's what's creating the stress, the, the insecurity, the overwhelm. Um, the low confidence, so that's good news. If it's our mind, then if we're able to tune into our mind and help ourselves, then, then obviously that's going to help our mind to click. So the A, as we can see, is for accept, B is for believing, and C is for choosing. We're going to go into each one in more detail. So when it comes to accepting, if you can see here, we have a, we have a cartoon here of this woman on a, wobbly, on a wobble board, right? So she's desperately trying to cling on. She's, she's really shaky. And she might be doing quite a good job of managing to, to cling on and stay okay, but she's not having a very relaxing time of it. And I would imagine that if someone came to talk to her while she was on this wobble board, it might not be the most productive conversation um, because she's so desperately trying to cling on. So I use the wobble board as an analogy for how we can get insecure. That underneath that wobble board is solid ground. So on the solid ground of being the person that Hashem created us to be, worthy, valuable, lovable, just because he created us unconditionally, suddenly in our minds, we start to create these wobble boards. I have to be the perfect mother. I have to have the perfect house. I have to make the perfect food. I have to always be feeling perfect. And then all of a sudden we're on these wobble boards shaking around and finding it very hard to walk or go anywhere. It's really going to come in the way of our production. Um, tying it into to Pesach, when Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim of Egypt, we were, in terms of performance, we were actually on the 49th level. We were on the lowest level, performance-wise, really low. And that's when Hashem gathered us up, hugged us and said, you're going to be my nation. Not because of how you're doing, we weren't doing well, but because of who you are. That's what makes you my nation. That's what makes you my beloved children. So this gives us permission that we're able to go off that wobble board. We're able to stand on the solid ground of always knowing that no matter what, we are valuable and lovable. There is nothing that we do or feel or think or say that is ever going to contradict that. I was talking to a woman the other day and she, she made some mistakes at the beginning of her marriage. She did. And she hurt her husband, not intentionally, but from the way that she was coming in from her own, her own baggage. And 
I was talking to her about it. I said to her, how would it feel to put all those moments of misunderstanding and you, when you would get upset with him when really he wasn't doing anything hurtful, you were just taking it very personally. How would you feel about putting all those moments in a helium balloon, cutting the string and letting them go? And she said to me, I don't know, like I really hurt him. I said, yeah, you did. But there's nothing you will ever do that takes away, that means that you have to be down and out on yourself. You might look at that thing and say, mm, not great, I need to work on that, I need to apologize for that, totally. But there's never a time when we in, in good faith need to say, oh, I need to feel horrible about myself now. I need to look down on myself now. I need to lose trust in myself now. That never, that is never ever the case. So sometimes we can hold we can hold this judgment on ourselves, which is the opposite of acceptance. We can hold this judgment on ourselves and we can hold ourselves on this wobble board with these very, very high expectations of ourselves. And innocently, without realizing it, we're actually really disempowering ourselves with that. If we're able to kick the wobble board to the side and step down onto the solid ground of who we are and move forward with that and make our the way that we act, of course, we want to be in line with who we are and we want to aim high, but without feeling that we have to have this constant courtroom popping up in our head. Are you good enough? Well, I don't know. I mean, look at look at the, look at the sink, look at all the dishes in the sink, you know, and, and, and this morning was a really hectic morning with the kids and, um, you know, look at the finances. I mean, are you earning enough and this and that and the other, right? So this whole courtroom that keeps going back and forth back and forth back and forth how would it be to just realize that we don't need the courtroom that we can actually be in life in the knowledge and the solid knowledge that Hashem loves us and if he loves us we can definitely incorporate that into our own self-love I was putting my Emmy my six-year-old to bed the other night and he was in a pretty good mood and he said to me I love you and daddy the same okay great and then he said, and I love myself and Hashem also the same. And I thought, brilliant. Okay, obviously I wanted to love Hashem. I wanted to know that Hashem is such a real presence in his life. I love the fact that he said, I love myself. That is such a, that's, that's what we're looking for. And somehow children seem to be able to access that easier. But we all have that kid inside who's totally cool with being loved and adored. And, and it's really, really open and waiting, just ready for us to let it surface and have space. So this acceptance of ourselves is so foundational for being able to perform. Very ironic. Sometimes we're hitting ourselves over the head, trying to make ourselves perform better, but that's disabling us. That's disempowering us. Um, there was an Israeli tennis player called Tal Ben Shachar. And he, he was good, really good. Um, he was a perfectionist. So before every game, he would be on the court for hours, practicing, pressuring himself, you know, perfecting every move as a guarantee that he was going to win the next day. Um, to the extent that his muscles started to, to give in, he, his body was literally not coping with the pressure, the physical pressure that he was putting it under. And um, to the extent that he had to leave tennis, and then he went into positive um, psychology and is now a lecturer at, at, um, at Harvard University. Um, and he talks about, which is our next slide, he talks about um, the perfectionist and the optimist. The perfectionist is aiming high with a very, very rigid line, as you can see here, very rigid line of of expectation. There's no room for tiredness. There's no room for moods. There's no room for trying something and realizing, mm, no, that's not going to work. Let's try it another way. Or, um, or learning from mistakes. It has to be constantly perfect. And he opened up a new phrase, which I find so powerful in us being able to aim high with a healthy outlook, with room to be a living, breathing human being. And that is the optimist. The optimist is aiming high. They are, as you can see, aiming to the same place as the perfectionist, but there's room 
there's room for twists and turns along the way. It's not that they're ever going to fall off that line. If they have a dip, they'll swing back up. I was talking as a therapist, I was talking to um, a client who's done so excellently in, in recovery from quite severe anxiety. And she said, and this, this was really, really resonated in me because she said, now when I have a dip, and I do, I have some hard days, I am okay with it. And I said to her, that is more impactful than if you would say, oh, I just had the most amazing day yesterday. Obviously, I'm happy if you have an amazing day, but the fact that you can have a dip and still retain your, your security in yourself and your foundation and your solid ground, that means that you really are on a healthy path of growth. So when we're, when we're in any type of performance, a pace of preparation can be one example of it, but it's in any area of life. When we are able to have an allowance, that means it's a bit like um, driving on the motorway. Like if you're driving on one lane, it's very tight. If there's a wider lane and there's a car in front of you, so you, you, you go into the left lane or no, you go into the right lane. You go into the right lane and you overtake or you stay in the right lane. There's just more room. So in the optimalist um, mindset, it's a much broader mindset. But if things come in the way, anxieties, worries, fears, insecurities, um, feeling a lack of confidence, um, comments from other people, there's just this room for it. It's okay to have a wobble and dip down and then realign ourselves with the goals that we have. I heard a cute quote. It says, behind every great man is a great woman and behind every great woman is a pile of washing and ironing. <laughs> so, you know, we do, we do as women, we do have busy lives, but if we can be on our own side, in whatever it is that we're doing and, and moving through our lists and navigating our relationships, if we can, if we can become our own friend in that and, and give ourselves that allowance, that can really, really help to energize us for the inevitable challenges that are going to come along the way. There's room for that. Um, okay, so going to the next is B, believe in Hashem and yourself. So it's interesting, I was learning, um, I was listening to a share and he, he was saying that a Rav called Rav Sadak says that emuna, which is the, the Hebrew word for faith, means believing in ourselves. Believing in ourselves is actually a part of having faith in Hashem. If you think about it, yeah, if you see a, um, a Ralph Lauren t-shirt or a, a Ted Baker handbag yeah you're automatically going to be more drawn to it you're going to you're going to um trust it because it was made by a great designer so in the same way if we can realize that we have been designed by the greatest designer ever the designer of the entire world if we can realize that that's us we've been designed by the greatest designer that means that we can believe in ourselves, that we can believe in the resilience and the wisdom and the energy that we have to be able to, to meet challenges and to be able to navigate life. Um, I, was, I was driving before, I, I don't know why, maybe to do with the weather, but there was the most beautiful sunset tonight. And I was obviously, because was, this was in my mind in terms of giving the shift, I was thinking like the one who created that created me. And it really gives you a, a certain appreciation. It's not about me for me. It's about the fact that Hashem created me. That really is the basis of our self-esteem. And as we say in the morning, my dear Annie, when I, I woke up this morning, actually not feeling so well, and I had a really busy work day um, and when I was saying the words at the end, Rabbi and when I said, what great is your faith. So we're doing that. I was saying thank you for returning my son and my soul to me. 
great is your faith? What's Hashem's faith? Like we have to have faith in him. And um, Rav Shlomo Graf, as that Sal says, that it's, we're talking about, we're saying your faith, as in your faith, Hashem, is his faith in us. He has faith in us. Who's going to be the biggest advocate of Bosch washing? It's going to be Mr. Bosch, right? He created it. He knows he used the best material. He didn't skimp on, on what he used. He wanted to be a top quality machine. He's going to be the biggest fan of it. So because Hashem created this, he knows what we're made of. He knows that we have a part of him inside us on the Shama. And therefore, he, his faith in us, and it really gave me a boost this morning of our Hashem. I had a great day. Um, but it's just sometimes our, our belief in ourselves can waver and we can feel pretty fragile. And sometimes we need to remember that he believes in us and, and sort of piggyback on that for a bit until our own belief in ourselves is able to kick in. Um, okay, so belief. So we're saying the B is for belief. So we're, obviously we're talking about believing in ourselves and believing in Hashem. We have to believe in both. We're partners in everything we do. There's a contract. We have to show up. The results are in Hashem's hands. That's the contract. Without Hashem, I can't. Without me, he won't. I was talking to, to an incredible woman who had who really su suffers with OCD. And I was saying to her, really, you're not really in control of your OCD. You can't make yourself not have these obsessive thoughts. So she said, well, then what am I doing here? So I said, what you're doing here, as in, in my therapist's office, what you're doing here is you are showing Hashem that you're taking responsibility for your issue and you're doing your part in working through your childhood issues, in finding the best way to move through the obsessive, the times when you have obsessive thinking. But the obsessive thinking it itself is not in your control. Now, this isn't a, a talk about anxiety, but the point I'm bringing is that it's really the same in any area of life, that we, we sometimes put so much pressure on ourselves to control things that we can't, to control people, any other person that we can't, and to control circumstances or even things that are going on in ourselves that we can't control, we can really put ourselves under pressure. So I think of it like a vending machine. With a vending machine, you put the money in, you put the code in, and down drops the can, whichever one you've chosen, right? And you don't create the can, but if you don't put the money in, the can won't come down. And that's exactly how this these two work together. We have to believe in ourselves to do the part that we can do, to put the money in, to put the code in, to have to, to show up, to try, to invest, to show what's important to us. And then we can let go and know that Hashem will send the can down. Hashem will send the result down. The perfect result will come down because We've shown up, but not as a direct result. It's not that we create it. We don't have to schlep that result out of ourselves. I was talking to a teenager the other day who was taking um, A-levels and she works really hard and, and she doesn't always do so well. And then she feels a failure. So I was explaining this to her that she can take pride in the fact that she's responsible about her work and she puts the effort in and she asks for help and support when she needs it. And then she can let go and know that she can take pride and believe in herself to do what she can do and to let go, give herself a break from trying to pressure herself to do what only Hashem could do. It's like trying to change the weather. It's like feeling a failure that today was, I don't know what it was like in London, but in Manchester, it was very cold and a little bit snowy and rainy. Um, so would I feel, oh, I feel so guilty. Like everyone had to wear coats today. Like what's the matter with me? Why can't I make it sunny? That would be ridiculous. It's not in my control. However much I care about my fellow inhabitants of Manchester, I can't change the weather. But we can sometimes pressure ourselves to change our moods and be perfect and, and make other people do things which are not in our control. 
or, or make events go perfectly, which is also not in our control. And really, we're doing the same thing to ourselves. We're forcing ourselves to change the weather. We're forcing ourselves to change things that really is not in our control. So when we're able to ease back and think to ourselves, hey, I'm going to believe in myself to do my part. What's my part here? And then we're going to do that responsibly. Absolutely. But then to be able to give ourselves a break, and let go. Like the other night, I had a I had a bad headache, and I was really not feeling well, and I would felt so vulnerable and so weak, and and then it, it sort of very naturally slipped into actually a very beautiful moment when I just felt like I came to the end of myself. It was like game over. You are not in control, and it was very liberating. It really to just realize like all that pressure, like we said before, all that pressure that can go on in our minds when we're we're beating ourselves up, <coughs> excuse me, or pressuring ourselves to control things we can't, and it's and it just came to asylum. And it was just a, a moment of realization, like just stop, don't stop being active, don't stop caring, don't stop being responsible. But stop pressuring yourself to make other people okay. I was involved in quite a few um, serious client cases. And I think that's what was getting to me. And it was just that moment of, of course, I'm going to keep showing up and caring and giving and, and doing my part. But that realization that I can't even make my own headache go away. Like, I'm not even in control of that. Why am I trying to control this teenager who's going through that and this um, woman who's, whose home life is falling apart. Like, why am I thinking that I can control that? Do I believe in myself as a therapist? Yeah. Am I going to show up? Absolutely. But it was just that ability to ease that. And it's not that then the next session, I was just sloughing on my, car, on my therapy chair, which I'm actually sitting in now. And, and just half-hearted, it wasn't half-hearted, it was absolutely heart and soul in, but without that pressure of making it happen. So this applies to all areas of our work life and our home life, of just being able to ease up on that forcing um, and being able to believe in ourselves and take pride in our investment, but let go of the results and know that we are in partnership with Hashem. And this belief, this, this stage two, the belief goes on both of us, on me and on him. Um, there's an amazing must, an amazing parable of the Dublin Maggid, where he says that a man in, in, in modern day terms was standing at the side of the road and this, and this guy slows down in his car to give him a lift. So the man jumps in and is holding this really heavy package, really heavy bag, suitcase or whatever it was. And so the driver looks back into the back seat and says, um, why are you holding it? This guy's uh, grunting and sweating with holding this really heavy thing. So, so the guy sitting in the back says, well, I, I mean, I really appreciate that you're giving me a lift, but I feel bad for you to take my package as well. Like, I'll hold it, right? Obviously, we all know that's ludicrous. If the, if the man, the driver, is giving him a lift, he's automatically taking his package as well. So sometimes, I have, a, I have a cartoon of it, sometimes we can look like this, where our minds are so taken up with all this heaviness. This cartoon was, <clears throat> was created for teenagers, so we've got school and the angry teacher and all the homework. Um, but we can try it, we can put in our own our own adult version of the same, which is just holding so many people and situations, the finances, the family dynamics, the practical things we have to do, the worries of the future, the, the guilt of the past, all heavy, heavy, heavy in our minds. And then we can just realize, hey, one second, who's making my heart beat? Who's making my lungs contract in and out? Who's, who's um, creating my circulatory system? Hashem is, is carrying us through life anyway. 
So you know what? You can carry all this as well. We can put down our heavy package and just allow him to carry it and show up with a clear mind to be able to do whatever we need to do in that moment. It's like it says in Tehillim, Hashvech al Hashem, like it's an um, throw onto Hashem, like throw your burden onto Hashem. And I love it because to me, it's like, it's like just like this energized, like putting it down, you know, this, this heaviness, just being able to let go of it and allow ourselves to put it down. So that's our second. So we're accepting ourselves, the ups, the downs, the people we are, the things that we're finding easy and the things that we're not. That's the first, that's the A. The B, we're believing in ourselves, believing because we've been designed by the world-class designer, capitalized. That's why we're able to believe in ourselves and we're able to believe that Hashem is our partner in everything we do. Someone once asked the Kotzka Rebbe, where's Hashem? And he answered as a little kid, he answered, wherever you let him in. And it's so true. Sometimes we can think that Hashem's in the big things, you know, the wedding and bringing two people together. Okay, yeah. You know, and in the big miracles, the historical miracles, of course he was there. But he's also in, in our, every tiny little detail of our lives. Like I said this morning, I woke up not feeling well and my, my Ellie got dressed without me asking him. And it was just that little wink. You know, he's in my morning. He's, he's there. He's not just in shul when, you know, when the men are taking out the safe attire. You know, Hashem, Hashem is, is right here with us. It's from the tiniest, most mundane example to the, the biggest, most dramatic example. He's there all the way through. So that's the B. And then we come to C, choice. As a mother, I'm very, um, I focus on choice a lot with my kids. I remember once I, because I want them to develop, really, choice is what we're in control of. Choice is really, um, yeah, where we have control, where we can get our empowerment, where we actually live from. So I remember what, I'm not sure which, which of my kids it was actually, and if, even if I did, I probably won't say, but I remember I gave them chicken and potatoes for supper, and I said, come on, so-and-so, come and eat. Um, and I remember they turned around to me and said, you have a choice. It can be the chicken or the potatoes. And I could just hear them like mirroring back what I'm often saying to them. You know, it's your choice. What would you like? Do you want this? Do you want that? And it's the same as we get older. It's no longer necessarily about chicken and potatoes. It's about whether we're going to be patient or not, about whether we're going to take a spiritual stance on something or just slip back into old habits. It's on whether we're going to fight healthily in a relationship and really, really work at it, or whether we're just going to give up on it. So choice is very, very central to our identity, to our ability to, to be in control. And when I, I counsel teenagers a lot and I see that they, they really sit up when you talk about choice and I'll say to them, you know, I'm here, I want to help you that I can only come to the middle of the room. And beyond that, your side of the room is totally out of my control. 100% your choice, whether you're going to share things, work, with, work together with me, allow, allow this to be successful. Um, and they love it because, because they're growing into that identity of being their own person. And that's really the foundation of being our own person is this ability of being able to choose. Um, the Hebrew word for a person, for a man or person is Adam, which is the same word as Adama, which is ground. Because ground, if you look at a piece of soil, it's pure potential. You could plant anything in it. Tomatoes, uh, lettuce, carrots, potatoes, anything in that piece of that, it's pure potential. So in exactly the same way, a person is potential. We, when you see a person, you don't, see, you can't say, oh, they can only manage that. It's, it, it, you just can't say that about a person because they are 
bottom, they are the same as ground. But as we were telling you before that, um, I'm sure most of you know that we that we lost a very, very, very great Torah giant called Rav Chaim Kanievsky, is that so? And he was incredibly great and incredibly diligent in the way that he used his mind and his time in his Torah learning. Um, and I, I'm not sure when it was, but fairly recently he had a scan, he had to have a brain scan because he had a stroke. And they saw such a difference physically on the scan. They said, the doctor said, normally when they do a scan, 10% of the brain has actually been used. 10% of the potential has actually been used. When they looked at his scan, 90% of the potential, that they could see in the, in the brain cells that they had been so actively used in his prior learning over so many years, it was actually physically visible. So that's Adam, that's a person. A person is not contained and constricted. A person can break out. And I, I have the privilege as a therapist to see it on a pretty much a daily basis, how people who are in such difficult circumstances or had such difficult childhoods are are able to, to grow in, in a way that just astounds me every time to see someone who breaks out of the pain and starts to grow and, and not only for themselves, for the, for the people around them, for the family members around them. And then very often they will then go and share their knowledge, their growth, their um, process in a way that empowers other people who are not yet at the stage that they're at. So that's a person, we have choice. We're not fixed. Um, in the laws of Shabbos, which are based around the, the, what was done in the tabernacle, in the Mishkan. So any activity that was done in the Mishkan, we are not allowed to do on Shabbos, it's in parallel. So one of the things they did was they had to trap animals to, to use the fur in the, in the coverings of the Mishkan. So there's a discussion in Gemara um, about whether trapping, which we're evidently not allowed to do on Shabbos, whether that applies to human beings. Can you trap a human being? Is that considered the, the um, prohibition of sod, of trapping? And there's a discussion back and forth because it definitely applies to animals. And the answer, the conclusion is that no, SARS does not apply to human beings. Trapping does not apply to human beings because you can't trap a human being. A human being has a mind. A human being can make choices. And therefore, even if you put them in a tiny room and you padlock the door and they can't get out physically, you still haven't trapped them because they have a mind. They can think, they can refrain. They can choose how they're going to approach it how they're going to move forward from it, how they're going to grow as a person from it, and therefore you can't trap them. Um, so the word for animal in, in Hebrew, which each Hebrew word is so significant, it tells us the essence. It's not just a way of saying it, it's in itself is the essence. So the word is behema for an animal and it's bar ma. In it is what it is. You, you're not going to get more than a cow. It is going to be a cow. And that's it. Whereas Adama, a person, sorry, Adam, a person, Adama, is it's all about potential. Um, when I talk specifically to women, when I talk about, about choices, I always make sure to focus on self-care. I was speaking to a girl um, who has a very difficult um, home situation, very dysfunctional home situation. She needs to move out for Yom Tov. Like she needs to move out um, and find somewhere. So she she was saying to me, "I I need to be selfish about this." Like, and which was progress for her. Instead of just thinking about everyone else, she's actually thinking about what she needs for herself to be healthy. Um, so while I was proud of her for saying that, I, I said, yes, but let's change it from selfish to self-caring. You know, it's not selfish to care about yourself. It's selfish to shut out the whole world and ignore everyone else's needs and not let them have any needs. But to say, I need to focus on myself and, and make sure that I have 
a workable setup for yourself. It's not selfish, it's self-caring. The other night I was um, picking my daughter up this time um, from, from a friend and the car was losing, the car was like, you know, when it like starts actually to go under the line, of the under the petrol line and my phone was losing charge. And I was laughing to myself because I, I, that's exactly how I felt. I felt like I was losing petrol and losing charge. And, and that's how we can feel. And we're all going to feel like that sometimes. But then we have a choice. Are we going to become the martyr who's dragging around, really ratty, and, um, and feeling really sorry for ourselves and really hard done to? Or are we going to take responsibility and say, OK, I'm losing charge. I'm not feeling great. I need to take care of myself physically, emotionally, spiritually, however, however we need to come in. And that can really help. If you think about the car, you think about the phone, we need to go places, we need to call people, we need to send messages. We're only going to be able to do that if we keep them charged. So we're exactly the same as people. We're only going to be able to, to give and function and do what Hashem wants us to do in his world when we are charged. Um, I remember a few years ago, I was, again, feeling a bit burnt out. And I was thinking, I really should sit down for 10 minutes with a hot drink, but I've got to see this and I've got to see that. I've got to see that. And then I thought, imagine if someone called now and said, okay, I have a woman here. She needs 10 minutes of your time. Can you manage? I would say, yeah, sure. I'm like, well, you're that woman. She needs 10 minutes of your time. You need 10 minutes of your own time. And I, it made me realize in that moment that self-care is, is a very, very spiritual act. It's looking, I call it, looking after one of Hashem's kids who happens to be me. It's, you know, we, we qualify as one of Hashem's, as Hashem's daughter. So if we're taking care of ourselves, yes, of course, that means that we're then going to be able to function. But that's not the only reason. In and of itself, that rest, that healthy meal, that um, inspirational talk or exercise or whatever it is that we're doing in the name of self-care, that itself, even before we then go and use that energy outwardly, which obviously has, has so much significance, but even before that, just that act in that moment is so powerful and so significant. Um, so just another point on choice is that we can choose to ask for help. And this can be practical help, like we can ask for, for practical help or emotional support from the people around us. And it also means that we can ask Hashem for help. It's like my, my five-year-old Mimi, she's the youngest of six. So she's nine are very independent, nine are adorable and really feisty, like very wants to really, really try and do things herself. And sometimes she'll say to me, mommy, can you help me? And I love her. Because she's asking me for help. She's actually asking me for help. And then I thought to myself, that must be what Hashem feels like. He wants us to ask him. He doesn't want us to just struggle, 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 struggle. Um, what they call white knuckling through, struggling, being a martyr. We can ask him for help. Please help me to have patience. Please help me to have clarity. Please help me to have self-respect. Please help me to have acceptance. That's, we can ask him. I remember walking along um, with, with one of my kids in town and there was a homeless person. And, and he, he was like quite upset to see it. You know, this person lying on the floor asleep. And he said to me, mommy, why doesn't he go to, the, why is he there? So I said, He's, he doesn't have money for a house. So, so then he said to me, why doesn't he go to the cash machine? Which is very cute because for Hashem, at that point, he doesn't realize that you actually have to have money in the cash machine to be able to take it out. But the point is that when we were born, we got a limitless card. Hashem gave us a limitless card that we, just because we're his kids, we get it that we can always go and cash in and ask Hashem to help us with the resources that we need. You know, if there's a difficult family event coming up, you know, please help me to stay grounded. 
Please help me to stay, to, to have perspective. Please help me to find the right support. Yet we can ask, we can keep cashing in this card and we're, we're never gonna be homeless. So just gonna end off with a story. Um, when we were, we must be married for about two years and we went to the Nirvana Hotel on the Dead Sea, gorgeous hotel. And it was Shabbos morning and there was, all, it was very peaceful in the lobby, couples walking around and my husband and I were standing there chatting. And we had our little one-year-old, our oldest, Ari. I have permission to say this story, I've asked him. Um, so he just learned to walk. He actually, learned, he actually walked very early at 11 months. And he was all proud of himself. Anyway, we're standing there chatting. And before we knew it, the Shabbos lift had automatically come to the bottom floor to the lobby where we were. And the doors obviously opened automatically and we're chatting. And before we knew it, in toddled Ari into the lift. And the doors closed and off it went up to the first floor. So my husband dashed up to try and catch him when the doors would automatically open on the first floor. As he got there, they were just closing and off it went to the second floor. And off he went and the same thing happened. So every floor, he's, I mean, Ari was fine because he could see his daddy like just there, that the doors kept closing, kept closing, kept closing. And then eventually it came back down and he came out totally fine. And that was the end of the story. But I was thinking about it that it says into him in Minham Mitzvah from Karasika, the, from the constriction I call out to Hashem, Anani Ban Merchav, he answers me with expansiveness. And to me, I like to think of it that in every moment, the lift doors are opening. We, we might be in a tight space, we might be being very judgmental of ourselves. And like we said before, pressuring ourselves to control everything and make everything perfect. And we might be feeling quite victimized, not aware of our choices. And in every moment, the doors open. And all we need to do is allow ourselves to step out into a world where, where we are enough. It's okay to be us. We're on solid ground. We can trust ourselves. We have the resilience, the wisdom, the ability for life, and we can be empowered in our choices and make choices that, that reflect our essence, reflect our worth. And with that, our minds can start to quieten down and we can start to really feel the benefit of a clear mind. Thank you so much for listening. I'm very happy 